Great. So uh, just to tell you a little bit about International Education Week, um, the U.S. Department of State and the U.S. Department of Education jointly celebrate uh, International Education Week, also known as IEW, for the past few years. The week of November 15 to 19 is International Education Week. This is designated to, uh, this is designed to celebrate the global reach of education and the significant impact that internationalization of education has in shaping a global community. U.S. universities value and actively welcome a diverse student body, which includes international students. So we are uh, doing this session to commemorate International Education Week, and it is in collaboration with uh, the consulate, uh, the U.S. consulate in Kolkata, as well as uh, U.S. IEF. Just before we start the session, I would like to tell you a little bit about Education USA uh, under U.S. IEF. So we are the only official source of information for U.S. higher studies, and we are supported by the U.S. government. Our mandate is to provide you with accurate, comprehensive, and current information, as well as be unbiased in our approach. So we represent all of the 4,700 plus U.S. universities and colleges in an unbiased manner, and we will help you find your best fit university. We have 430 centers worldwide in 170 countries, and eight of those centers are in India, in seven cities. So we have five centers under U United States India Education Foundation, and for faculty members and scholars, we also administer the Fulbright uh, Fellowship Program, which is not for students, but it's for uh, working professionals and scholars. So without further ado, I would like to introduce your visa officers uh, who will be interacting with you in today's session. So first we have with us Mr. Clint Wallace, who is the Vice Consul at US Consulate uh, General Kolkata. He is a management honed officer serving as a consul officer in his first entry level tour. Uh, Clint attended the U.S. Air Force Academy from 2005 to 2009. He majored in economics with a minor in Mandarin Chinese. Uh, Clint was attracted to military school because his father served in the U.S. Army, and this allowed him to serve uh, his country without giving up on the dream of higher education. After graduating, Clint joined the Air Force as, it required, uh, as is required of all academy graduates. He uh, spent five years in the military before returning to school to get his master's degree in organizational uh, leadership at the University of Oklahoma. He uh, completed his degree virtually, uh, spending his nights and weekends reading essays, watching pre-recorded lectures, and submitting papers online. So this, uh, Clint was already preparing for this new world way back then. Uh, a year later, Clint decided to get an MBA to prepare his transition out of the Air Force, he picked the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, where he attended in person, uh, building on his undergraduate degree. So after graduating, Clint rejoined the Air Force for three years before deciding to take up a job at Facebook. Uh, he spent a year in tech before joining the State Department, ultimately arriving in India. So welcome, Clint. And as we see, uh, you have a very, very diverse background, and we are so excited to talk to you and learn more about your experience as a student, not only in person, but also as a virtual student, because so many students must be wondering about that as well. Uh, the second visa officer we have with us is Mr. Timothy Braun, or he goes by Tim, is a, a vice uh, consul at US Consulate General Kolkata. He is a public diplomacy coned officer serving as a consul officer in his first entry level tour. Tim grew up in rural North Illinois uh, and completed a bachelor's degree in English language and literature with minors in history and international studies from Aurora University in the Chicago suburbs. After graduating, he joined the university as a resident fellow at its interfaith center where he led uh, student programs and community uh, license efforts. Uh, part of the, his duties included uh, delivering public presentations on topics of geopolitical concern. Interested in learning more about the world and its people, Tim moved to Colorado and earned a master's degree in international studies at the University of Denver in Joseph Corbell uh, School of International Studies with a concentration in religion and politics in the Middle East and Central Asia. 
Following graduate school, Tim served as a communications manager for Islamic Networks Group, a national nonprofit organization that counters uh, bigotry through education and interfaith engagement. He also founded and operated Colorado's first fake meat company. Uh, just prior to joining the U.S. State Department, Tim worked as a partner specialist for On Deck Capital, an online small business, business lender, where he steered communications and training strategies for the firm's external partners. So both of Clint and Tim both have very, very diverse backgrounds. And today we are going to have a very fun conversation with them to learn more about uh, what it meant for them to study uh, in the United States uh, as students themselves. And let's, uh, we will have a, uh, like you know go back and learn more about their journey uh, i just want to uh, quickly tell you a little bit about international education in the us before that uh, we have 1.6 lakh indian students who have chosen the united states as a top uh, study destination that's it's still the number one uh, study abroad destination for indian students and 20 percent of the international student population in the us is made up of indian students as the second largest population and the reason students choose it is because of its flexibility, its uh, curriculum practical training opportunities such as CPT and OPT, which where you can work internships as well as after your graduation. Uh, there is a lot of emphasis on critical thinking. So you are being taught to think differently, just like when I was studying in the United States, it was completely a different experience. And uh, you really needed to, uh, you know, like uh, learn how to take good feedback as well as bad feedback. There's a lot of diversity in the United States. So there is, uh, that is another skill that you will develop how to, uh, you know, like communicate in a multicultural context, how to learn uh, and how to see the world and issues from different perspectives, uh, learning alongside people who have grown up with different uh, stories than you. So that is something also that is very unique and that why uh, students choose to study in the United States. Education USA itself guides you through the five step process. So I will share our contact details at the end of this webinar. We will help, uh, we help students research your options to so understand all of the colleges that are out there, finance your studies, understand what are the scholarships available, how to fund your studies, how to make a budget, complete your application, all of your essays, testing and all that. Applying for student visa, this is after getting admitted. So we do have, consular officers like the ones present today who have webinars specifically for visas when the time is to like you know you have the time to apply for the visa so you can come to us we are the most official source of information and we can guide you through that process and lastly preparing for departure we are not only invested in get helping you get an admit to the university but being successful and thriving after that so we will share resources on helping you understand how to be successful at a u.s university so now that you know about the process, you know about how to go about everything, let's jump into, uh, you know, like the, the meat of this uh, presentation and let's chat with our consular officers. So before I begin, would any of you like to say a few words of encouragement to our students or, or welcome? I just say uh, sure. thanks for oh, this today. <laughs> Look forward to talking about our experiences, and um, uh, hopefully that can help inspire you on your journey to uh, pursue education in the United States. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, I would just echo the same. Uh, we talk to a lot of aspiring students every day, and I think the things that jump out to us the most are when we can hear the story from the student and understand where they're headed, and that helps us do our job well. So we want to share kind of our background, and hopefully you can do the same. Um, whenever you get to your disappointment. Awesome. Thank you uh, to both for uh, welcoming our students. And uh, just to let you know that I know all of you have been muted and your videos have been turned off and you must be feeling a little controlled right now. But you can definitely put in any questions you have in the chat box for our uh, visa officers. And in the end, we will try to reserve at least 20 minutes to uh, answer any questions you may have. So uh, now let's first, I know all of you must be either in high school or university or colleges looking to apply for bachelor's or master's uh, degrees in the United States. So uh, obviously our visa officers were also there 
you know, at some point. So let's talk a little bit about their high school and where they come from and what degrees did they aspire to study? I know I've covered it in the bio, but let's just talk a little bit about that uh, and why they chose those degrees. So my first question would be to Clint and then uh, to Tim, is what degrees do you hold and from which universities? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so I have a bachelor's in science and economics from the Air Force Academy um, and a MBA from the Naval Post Graduate School and then also a master's in organizational leadership from the University of Oklahoma. Amazing. And, Tim, and I, have a, I have a bachelor's degree in English language and literature from Aurora University, which is in the suburbs of Chicago. Mm -hmm. and a master's degree in, in international studies from the University of Denver, which is just about an hour north of where Clint went to his undergrad. So we have a connection in the state of Colorado. Thank you. So uh, both of you do have a bachelor's as well as a master's degree. I think Clint has two master's degrees, uh, an MBA and one in organization. So uh, that's great to know. Okay, so before you uh, applied for an undergraduate degree, I guess let's just talk a little bit about your high school and where you grew up. So uh, maybe we can start with Tim for this question. Sure. So I grew up um, on a farm in Northern Illinois, about two hours outside of Chicago. So when it came time to apply to universities, I applied to just about every school that I knew within a two hour radius. And I got accepted to most of them. But in the end, I chose Aurora University. It was a, I was close enough to home to where I could go home and visit on the weekends if I needed to. And that was a big um, reason for how I chose that school. Okay, great. And uh, Clint? So I grew up in uh, Beaverton, Oregon. So it's actually where Nike headquarters is at. Um, so we actually had some school events there growing up. Oh. Um, I kind of had the opposite approach as Tim. I wanted to get as far away from Oregon as I could. I needed to see the world. So I feel a little bit almost like a, an international uh, aspiring student. Um, and so I ended up settling in Colorado, which wasn't too far away, but it was definitely a flight uh, from Oregon. Great. So two very different perspectives. And just to add to that, like I did choose to go to the United States. So that was 8,000 miles away from home. So I guess even further than what either of you did, but um, it's good to know your aspirations and why you chose to go where you did. Um, like, again, like students, it is good to look at the location where you want to go because each different state has a different culture and different opportunities. Uh, let's uh, now talk a little bit about your major and most importantly, why you chose that major. So uh, we can begin with Clint and then go to Tim. Yeah, so I chose economics and I sometimes feel like I got lucky. I had a really, really good economics teacher uh, my senior year of high school. And so I think that I probably would have just picked like a general degree and figured out what to major in later. But he was a really awesome teacher, inspired me and kind of unlocked the passion. Um, even when I told folks that I was majoring in economics like why that's boring it's a lot of math but i just i loved it um, because i had that one teacher that made a difference so. that's lovely i think uh, just having a teacher uh, inspire us in high school is so important and i'm sure a lot of students do choose those degrees because of that now let's let's hear from tim so for the undergrad degree, when I got to campus, my plan was to eventually become an entertainment lawyer. And we did not have an entertainment law program at that college. So I had made a bit of a mistake. Uh, so I decided instead to pursue theater. Um, but then we very quickly got rid of that program. So by the end of my first semester, I was kind of looking for a major. And um, my guidance counselor said, well, what about English? You like to write. Um, and I said, yeah, I do. I like books. So I started moving in that direction. And to be honest, I probably should have done that from the very beginning. I'm pretty sure my guidance counselor in high school told me to do an English degree, but I resisted. So I eventually found uh, myself back in studying English language and literature, which is what I should have been doing all along. And as we noted in the intro, when it came time for grad school, I was very interested in geopolitics because I was giving community presentations on those topics. 
And I knew that an international studies degree would be a great way for me to learn more about the world and its people. That's just lovely to know, Tim, because um, I think a lot of us are given these prophecies by our school counselors, and we all want to test it out ourselves. Uh, so it's great to see how you were able to change majors in university and, you know, like really find your own because as 17 year, uh, as 17 year olds, we don't expect students to exactly know what they want to do. So the U.S. university is a great place for this flexibility where you can try out new things, find out if you like theater, find out if you like you know, like uh, geopolitics, for example, or if you like uh, economics, you like mathematics. Uh, I double majored in business economics and psychology. That's a combination you can't find anywhere in the world, except maybe Scotland, that was a university where I had applied, where you find this combination. So it's a really, like you can really combine anything and everything. I would have friends who would combine, I guess, uh, there was a, a friend of mine who combined dance with mathematics and they were understanding the different dance movements and like, you know, the geometry that went on behind it. There was a friend who combined French and new, uh, like a neuroscience. So they were understanding how different bilingual uh, people, uh, like how their brain lights up when they're speaking different languages. So really the possibilities are unlimited and it's great to know about uh, what majors both of you chose. Um, let's, let's move on uh, to the next question and ask about your application process. So both of you did choose different types of schools. Uh, so maybe Tim, you can uh, talk about uh, in high school or even in fact, before your master's degree, uh, any resources or scholarships that you received, anything that helped you in your application Sure. Um, in high school, my guidance counselor was very useful in um, helping me explore what kinds of programs were out there, the difference between a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Science degree, for instance. And speaking with uh, designated school officials at the various universities, that was also helpful because I could ask, oh, do you have a program in, you know, in, in say, economics? And they would say, yes, we do. Or they would say, no, we don't. And that could help me figure out which schools were the right fit for me. And uh, the same thing happened uh, for graduate school. I didn't have a guidance counselor per se, but dealing with designated school officials, asking them questions about the campus life, talking even to current students, um, because sometimes guidance counselors will, will put you in touch with uh, real students you can ask questions of. And that was very useful uh, for me as well. And I, I did receive a small scholarship on my way to undergrad. I think it was something like basically 30,000 rupees, um, which compared to the cost of an education in the United States was fairly small, but it meant a lot to me that my high school, it, it came from my high school. They were giving me that as a uh, saying, we believe in you, you can do this. Um, and then there were some merit scholarships for my graduate uh, studies as well. Awesome. And just to kind of uh, ask you more about that, Tim, the graduate scholarships, were they like an assistantship or a fellowship? Like what kind of scholarships were they? They were that? only financial. So there, I mean, we could do in graduate school, I worked on campus as I did in undergrad uh, for like a, a student work study program. But there was also um, an award that was effectively a tuition waiver for a portion of the cost of the school. But it was based on academics and merit. So there was no, um, I didn't have to do anything for it once I got to campus except okay. complete the degree. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, on my end, so looking at undergrad programs, uh, the all the service academies in the United States have their there are basically representatives that kind of float around in different communities and help you learn about the school. So not unlike what you know USIF does. Um, and so I was able to ask a lot of questions. I had no idea about what the Air Force was. And so it was really helpful to have someone kind of like hold my hand and explain it. Um, and then I could make an informed decision for myself. Um, it's kind of an interesting program in that um, basically everyone's on a full scholarship. So I think that my experience isn't quite as relevant, but um, for my, uh, Masters of Art in Organizational Leadership. I remember looking at programs that I would be able to do while working, you know, doing at night and on the weekends. And I remember I had this huge spreadsheet and I basically Googled all the state schools of all the 50 states 
and try to figure out what the cost was, what the time commitment was, how often I have to go in person. So um, I think it can be very helpful to cast a wide net and just be very organized and, and find the right program for you. Thank you, that's lovely, uh, Clint, especially a reference to the Excel sheet that you created. I think that's one of my favorite advice to students is just create an Excel sheet, be extremely organized and do a wide variety of research. So just like there are many agents, you know, like kind of uh, floating around the United States, we do have the same representatives of universities also coming down to India. So it's become very international now. And we do have, you know, like uh, representatives and current students around the world. So in fact, we do have an alumni, alumni fair, which is going to happen virtually on Thursday. So you can meet around 50 universities and alumni from those universities uh, virtually and talk to them and get information. So I think that's a very interesting and uh, good piece of advice uh, i guess moving on uh, maybe uh, and again like uh, clint you were on a hundred percent scholarship you said for the bachelor's program and was it is the same for your mba program as well you were for a hundred oh okay very good <laughs> that's very uncommon just to let you know students but uh, it's it's great to know um, okay the next question was about the admissions test did you take any before applying and how did it kind of uh, reflect on your application? So maybe, uh, yeah, Clint could go. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, so I took the SAT. Uh, it was the old SAT that uh, caps out of 1600. So I'm apparently there's a new SAT that's a higher score now. So I, I don't know how all that worked, but I took the SAT. Um, there were a couple of physical tests that you had to take as well because it's a military school, but then I just wrote a lot of essays. And so um, if I could just make a plug, writing an essay or, um, you know, giving an interview is a skill like anything else. And so it's helpful to practice writing that stuff out. So that way, if you're in a crunch situation, you're, you're ready. You don't just have to try to figure it out on the spot. But yeah, a lot of essays, the SAT, and then I said a couple of physical tests. Awesome. And even it's same for grad school, is it? Uh, grad school is more complicated. Uh, on the for the University of Oklahoma, that was a couple more essays. Um, no more tests were required. You know what? No, yeah, I took the GRE. Excuse me, um, but yeah, those were a little bit different. Thank you. We're moving on to Tim. For my bachelor's degree, um, we did have to have an ACT score on file. That's a, a test much like the SAT, but a slightly different uh, scale. Um, it's out of 36 points total. So 36 is the best you can do. I took it once and got a 27. Then I took it again and got a 29. Then I took it a third time and got a 32 because the test was free to take. I found out later that the higher scores didn't actually help. All the, all the universities needed was a, was a minimum score that I had already reached, but um, maybe I was just feeling extra ambitious about having a good score on the test. So that was a, that was a good experience. Uh, and then for grad school, as Clint mentioned, the GRE, um, I did have to have a score on file in order to apply to graduate schools. Awesome. So there were definitely school, uh, tests that both of you took. Um, to get into the different universities. And I think I really uh, like the advice about, uh, I guess like, you know, uh, having, knowing what minimum score or what base score your shortlisted universities require so that you're not like wasting time unless you are just, it's a game for you <laughs> that uh, to like, you know, keep taking the tests again and again, because they're like, uh, you know, Clint and Tim both have mentioned there are so many essays you need to write. There's so much other stuff you have to do. So be very focused on what is required and when it's okay to just be happy with the score you have. If the universities you are applying to just require that score. Uh, great, so um, I, I again, like I can also kind of plug into the test I took. Um, I took the SAT, uh, I think I took it twice and I submitted my super score. Uh, I, at that time it had become what uh, Clint is saying, the 2400 SAT. So uh, at the, we did have an essay, we had a writing section, um, a math section. Now it's come back to the 1600. So we don't, there is no essay for students anymore. And uh, a lot of universities have become test optional for the upcoming year only. So do not be dis, uh, delusioned if they are, if you're applying for the next 
uh, like 2023 still uh, consider taking the test because they may be required again for most universities. Uh, okay, now talking a little bit about, uh, you know, like uh, it's, it's very common in India for uh, studying uh, in the US to be a family decision. Uh, you know, there's a lot of say of the family specifically because of the financial, uh, you know, like implications of going to the US. So it definitely is a discussion you have to have uh, to understand what budget you have to, uh, you know, like uh, dedicate to studying abroad. So uh, maybe if both of you could kind of touch upon um, if, if your family was supportive or was it like, what, did they want you to study what you studied? Uh, was there any kind of conflict there or any support there? So maybe we can go to Tim and then Clint. Sure, uh, both of my parents, uh, or rather my mother and father's generation in my family was the first to get college degrees. So they had bachelor's degrees in the hard sciences. And when it came time for me to apply to college, I remember asking them if it, <laughs> if it was okay that I was doing a degree in the liberal arts. And they said, yes, of course, Tim, that's fine. Um, and then, uh, so that, that worked out well. Um, for graduate school, this question is interesting because it also has a flip side. How supportive was your family in you studying outside of the United States? So there was a time when I was applying to graduate schools that I was planning on attending school internationally. So I had applied to schools in Scotland, in the UK, in Turkey, and in Italy. And when I told my family, oh, I might go study in, say, Turkey, they were, um, you know, sad that I might be living that far away, but also happy for me because they knew that I was following the kinds of things that I was interested in and that I wanted to do. And I think that um, sometimes family can push back against what students want, especially when they're younger. And um, that has both positive and negative effects. But I know that my, my family didn't strongly push me in any one direction. I think that's just lovely. I think that's a great family because you did live so close to them for your bachelor's degree. I guess it must have been a big transition for them to grow up with you and letting you, you know, like uh, consider studying uh, internationally as well. So that's definitely, um, I think the correct kind of mindset to have towards your children is to let them do what they want, but obviously provide them with some guidance from their experiences. Uh, let's go to Clint and hear from about his family and how supportive they were. Sure. Um, so my mom was not very happy that I was uh, joining the military at a young age. And so I do remember her being a little, you know, a little sad, but she got over it pretty quickly. Um, my dad was obviously very happy that I was following in his footsteps. Um, and I, I just uh, uh, kind of echo what Tim was saying, having a supporting family, supportive family is very helpful because being a few states away, um, being able to hop on the phone and talk with them and kind of have that support network was really important. Um, and then by the time I was looking at graduate stuff, uh, my parents were kind of hands off the wheel and they figured, you know what, if you made it this far, then your, your decision making is, is probably working out for you. So um, having a supportive family is huge. And sometimes it's not only your biological family too, right? You know, um, older friends, mentors, anyone out there that can support you, it's really important to have a, a network to keep you successful. Awesome, thank you for that, uh, you know, description of uh, about your family and like, you know, that some of them were at uh, first supportive, but at the same time, there's a lot of emotions involved in like, you know, letting your uh, kids go a little further than you would like. Uh, I remember I, when I was um, wanting to study abroad, I was the first person in both sides of my immediate family, uh, like to uh, decide to study in the, uh, to study abroad at all, like, you know, in the United States. So it was a whole family discussion. And there was this whole, uh, you know, like this uh, permission I had to take from both sides of my family as a girl child to go so far away and really study. There was a lot of concerns about safety, about, uh, you know, like, uh, how would I uh, manage on my own? I had been in the same high school since I was three till I was 18 years old, which is very common in India. So it was very, it was really a big emotional decision and financial one because uh, obviously my parents did not plan to uh, send me abroad. The uh, funds are very, very different when you are trying to study in internally versus when you're trying to study uh, in the United States. So there was definitely a discussion about finances. 
uh, but at the end of the day uh, i think they were my mother was the most supportive of me and she really wanted to uh, me to experience the independence and understand and get a, like you know exposure and really speak for myself because she didn't want me to be sheltered anymore she wanted me to go and see the world and make my own decisions make my own mistakes and suffer their consequences as well but uh, and i had to be confident enough to do that too at 17 years old to just up and be like okay i'm going to just move halfway across the world and reintroduce myself to people uh, whereas at home everyone knew me since i was 3 years old so it was really a cultural transition and a very big decision that i guess my family took and it was a risk because i feel like when i did arrive in the us and was the first one to graduate abroad in both sides of my family uh, that was a very proud moment for everyone that okay there was some success that came out of this venture so <laughs> i think um, definitely having a supportive family being in touch with your family is so important we do sessions with parents with veteran parents as we call them uh, i know it's a different uh, the military term but <laughs> who have successfully sent students abroad and you know they can they can ask the questions to the prospective parents who are sending students abroad all right so we have discussed about uh, your student backgrounds where you were uh, studying before you applied to uh, the degrees of like you know uh, university degrees now let's talk about your college experience itself so i guess my first question is to tim in college what activities did you do outside of academics so um american universities in the united states tend to have a lot going on in terms of student activities. A lot of clubs, there are sports, um, official and unofficial, um, all kinds of things. And when I started my undergrad career, uh, there weren't many things going on on my campus. My school had gone through a period of some years where uh, they had had declining enrollment, made a bunch of big changes, got some uh, endowment money and whoosh, uh, all kinds of new student offerings. So for the first two years I was on campus, there wasn't a whole lot going on, which was too bad. Um, but as more activities started to come around and there was programming and all kinds of other uh, student clubs, I got involved in the English club where we did really cool things like write poetry and short stories, but also did theater outside of the classroom. I, I did take a minor in theater um, after they canceled the major program. But uh, I did uh, community theater productions on campus and um, some other just kind of common interest clubs talking about movies or art. And then in graduate school, the most of the programs on campus were for undergrad students, but there were still things that we could plug into. So I worked with and volunteered with the uh, school's interfaith club and spent a lot of time at their meetings and working on their programs. That's great to know, Tim, especially about uh, your involvement with the interfaith clubs. Uh, I think uh, it's more common in the US to have, uh, you know, like uh, clubs for everything. Like if you have a certain identity, there will probably be a club where you can feel like you belong. And uh, those are really special clubs. Uh, students who want to develop a certain interest in, you know, something can actually, like I would always uh, ask all my friends to come to the uh, South Asia club uh, meetings with me and they may be from around America. They, they were international friends as well. And now when it was say, for example, Diwali last week, I wished all of them happy Diwali and they knew, knew exactly what I meant and they wished it back to me. So that is also spreading your cultural, you know, knowledge as well as learning from other people. And that's the beauty of an American education. Uh, okay, let's go to Clint uh, and talk about your experience. Yeah, I just want to echo uh, that same point that you made, Anadi. I think that the kind of mixing is one of the best benefits of college in general, and especially in the United States. Um, the Air Force Academy has folks from every single state in the U.S. as part of the way it's designed. So it was definitely a culture shock, but I came out so much stronger and knowing, you know, people who were very different than me, who did not grow up in Oregon, and some who couldn't even pronounce the state correctly. Um, I'm talking about Americans, so that's what we're dealing with. Um, uh, and I think part of that uh, mixture and diversity came from some of the outside activities. So, for example, I had never snowboarded before I got to Colorado. That's some of the best. It is really the best snowboarding in the United States. So I joined the snowboarding club and I knew no idea what I was doing, but there were some upper classmen that could help show me the ropes. And now it's one of my favorite things to do. Um, there was lots of 
uh, leadership type activities um, and just a lot to do outside of the actual academics. So it's definitely one of my favorite parts. That's great. Like the outdoor activities are definitely, um, you know, the, U the US is so big and they have so many different terrain. So you can have these outdoor kind of clubs uh, and hike with your friends and, you know, like really experience uh, the different national parks. I remember uh, when I was working in the US, I went to Yosemite National Park and that was really a different experience on its own. Like it was just something else. I went with my mother. And uh, I guess those kind of opportunities you have in college as well, where you can do these outdoor activities. Uh, let's talk a little bit about internships. I know both of you had very di diverse interests and, you know, your degrees were also quite diverse. Uh, Y'all touched the corporate world, like just touched it and came back. Like I think uh, Clint went to Facebook and Tim did something uh, in the business world as well. Uh, but uh, if you could talk about, uh, you know, how you formulated these interests, like uh, what were the internship experiences you availed of or uh, was there any career services that helped you on uh, either your bachelor's or master's campus? Sure. Um, so in graduate school, I completed two separate internships, one for each year that I was in graduate school. The first was at a publishing company, um, which is not at all what I was doing, but or not at all what I was studying, but the books that they were publishing were on international politics. So it was a chance to see how people, how the academics who were writing these books were making them happen, were getting their ideas out to a wider audience. And then the second internship was a humanitarian organization um, in Denver that worked with partners in Kenya. So it was a good opportunity to uh, see how international development worked and to talk to people doing really important work um, in Kenya. And it's also where I met another intern who would eventually become my wife. So sometimes that happens too. But in both cases, the career services team at the university was very integral in connecting me to those experiences and making sure that I was well positioned to um, be awarded those internships and that it would be something that counted for credit, which is very important and would be rewarding for me. They didn't want me to do something that wouldn't help me in my future career. Very interesting. And uh, just to uh, kind of uh, question you off of that, these career services were something you proactively uh, approached yourself or were they already offered to you when you went into college? We knew they were there. Um, there was, we would be reminded of the services available to us as uh, students and the um, Career Services Center was very close to where I worked in the library. So it was a very quick walk over there when I needed to ask them something. But we, we knew where those uh, services were. And on United States uh, university campuses, there is no shortage of resources like that. Lots of maps and little wall things that say which office is where. And all of those things are there for you. And it's partly what you pay for with your tuition. So you should use them if you can. Yeah, and it's interesting because there's no like homeroom teacher, you know, there's no class teacher like we have in uh, high school or in India where uh, they tell you, okay, now it's time to go to the career services. You have to do that yourself. So I found that very interesting. It's not really integrated into the academic departments in any way. You have to go to, you need to know where they are and you need to go and, you know, use these services. So I think that's very important to note as well. Uh, okay, so that's great to know. Uh, Clint, would you like to talk about your experiences? Yeah, sure. So um, once again, I have to diverge a little bit. The internships work a little bit different, uh, but I can talk about high school. I did uh, an internship at Nike and then a separate one at the uh, local Libertarian Party uh, in Beaverton. So in both of those cases, kind of uh, wild like Tim, I wasn't necessarily looking at either roles, but it was um, interesting to see just what the professional world looked like, kind of remove yourself from that educational setting and become look at the new ones, you get a chance to uh, prepare for it ahead of time. And I do have a bit of a funny story. So it was like the second or third day of my internship at Nike. And I actually got like, I parked, I was in a hurry. And so I parked really quickly and a little bit of my tire was on the line in the parking space. And they ticketed me and it said like, if we ticket you again, then your car will be towed and you can't park at Nike again. So they take parking very seriously. If you ever find yourself in Oregon, make sure to park very carefully. 
Awesome. Thank you for that very uh, interesting story. Um, I think this is very much geared to us uh, in India, <laughs> where we do not take parking very seriously at all or driving very seriously. It's just maneuvering a car somehow, <laughs> getting through from point A to point B. But yes, rules are very strict. And that's very funny. Like that. Did your car get towed though? In, or was it not? No, that was the the warning, and so I it worked, it did its purpose, and I was warned, and I didn't screw up again. <laughs> That's lovely. I think uh, for me, internship experiences was on campus more than anything else. I did something known as applied mathematical research experience. It was known as AMRI, where students were put in consulting groups of three, and uh, my it was an interdisciplinary group. So I was a uh, uh, psychology and econ major there was another economics uh, student as well as one student who was an art and a mathematics major so we were supposed to understand retention practices in the school why do students stay or leave uh, the college and uh, in the end we had to come up and present this uh, you know like a business plan to the uh, to our college administration to follow to identify students who are at risk of staying or leaving so it's very interesting how, again, it's nothing, wasn't much to do with what I was studying or what I was interested in, but it was just nice to kind of get that consulting experience of uh, solving a project with people of different backgrounds. So I think it's always nice to jump into these experiences, uh, you know, and find out uh, how they are done. Uh, okay, uh, moving on, uh, let's let's talk about uh, relationship with international students on campus. Now, I know it'll be a little different for, for Clint because he was in the uh, Air Force, uh, like, you know, academy, which uh, does not have a lot of international students. But maybe, Clint, if you could just quickly touch upon any uh, relationship you had with, like, you know, uh, the diversity on your campus. Yeah, absolutely. We actually do have some international students. It's a bit more formal because the military of that nation needs to recommend the person to go to the Air Force Academy. But some of my good friends, um, so my good friend Angelica Plaza, she's um, she's married to a buddy of mine now, but she was in the uh, she was in the Colombian Air Force, and she told us lots of things about Colombia. And I honestly, at 18 when I met her, didn't know where Colombia was, couldn't point it out on a map. Um, we had a cadet from Ecuador and one from France as well. So there definitely was a little bit of a flavor. It just had a different way to get there, I guess. Very interesting. And Tim, yeah. Um, so for my undergrad uh, time, we did not have very many international students on campus. That program wasn't well developed at the time. I know that since I left, it's grown massively and they routinely bring them in. but. Uh, for my grad school um, experience, there were a lot of international students. Um, the University of Denver sends all of its under, almost all of its undergrads abroad for study programs during their junior or senior year, but it also um, pulls in lots and lots of international students. So in my like immediate friend group in grad school, there were people from Armenia, Germany, Chile, Mexico, Nepal, Pakistan and Saudi Arabia and Cameroon. So uh, a very like a my program was international studies, but just the people in the program was kind of like a different level of international study. So we uh, talked a lot about our various cultures and our countries, and I think maintained very good relationships with international students. I didn't know at the time exactly what that meant, I just thought, oh, it's someone from another country who comes to school here. But now I know the entire visa process, everything that comes beforehand, it's much more involved. So I, I definitely respect uh, them more now knowing um, what they had to go through to get visas to come here. But I think generally um, students on uh, university campuses in the United States are curious about the world and about other cultures and really do want to learn. that helps create a, like a warm and welcoming atmosphere on every university campus that I've seen. Thank you. That's really like a very nice answer to uh, like, you know, about international diversity on campus. Sorry, there's some construction going on. Uh, for the sake of time, let's just skip a few questions and just talk about um, what, like if you had a favorite professor on campus and how did they, how did you interact with him or her? So uh, 
either one of you could answer this question before we move on to the next slide. I absolutely had a uh, favorite professor in my MBA program. Um, and so she is also in the Air Force. And so she kind of graduated from professor into professional mentor for me. Um, and it was just, it's really great to have someone who has kind of been through the path before you and can kind of tell you what to look out for um, and also give you an objective point of view that maybe your family or friends can't. So I highly recommend um, you know, just being on the lookout for kind of an informal mentor like that if you can find one. And I would say like choosing a favorite professor is difficult in, in both like across bachelor's degree and uh, master's degree, dozens of instructors um, that I've had, picking one favorite one is difficult, but it would probably be um, a man named Dr. Forward. And Dr. Forward was by training a Christian Methodist minister, but he was also a scholar of religion generally, uh, especially Islam. In fact, he spent, I think, three years studying and teaching in Hyderabad uh, here in India. And he always told me, he said, Tim, you'll have to go to India someday. And now I live here. But he was um, a great influence on me, helped me see the world in a very international way. He was also uh, from England. So um, he oriented around things slightly differently um, than other Americans like myself. But he was a very good influence on me. I eventually traveled to other countries with him and worked for him because when I graduated, I stayed on, uh, on the campus as a resident fellow at the university's interfaith center, which he managed. So we ended up being co-workers as well, but uh, a great influence um, and, a, and someone who could uh, help you figure out problems. And that's really what professors should be. They teach, they teach you how to think, but they can also be friends and advisors. Wow, that's, that's really good to know. And uh, definitely, you know, like just uh, the closeness of professors and students is really something unique and on US campuses. Uh, let's just quickly go over this uh, last piece. I, I really wanted to talk about this because, uh, you know, like we don't anticipate how much what we have learned in the past affects our present. And I think it's very important to acknowledge what we had picked up in college that kind of really helped us uh, helps us still right now. So uh, maybe we can uh, talk, uh, you know, each of you could take a, f uh, a few questions. Uh, so maybe let's talk about, I guess, two skills uh, you used in your current job that you picked up while you were in college. So maybe let's start with Tim uh, and then uh, Clint can answer a different question. Sure. So um, United States uh, Department of State Foreign Service officers like Clint and myself, uh, have to do a lot of different things at our jobs. So having good skill sets in a wide variety of things is crucially important. And two of the ones that I picked up from my time in college that served me every single day are the ability to research and the ability to think critically. So on the research side, um, if I was writing a big paper or uh, trying to find out uh, like a program that fit a particular like event, um, looking at a bunch of information and figuring out what was important and what was just background was very, very helpful in moving things along quickly, knowing what is important and what is not. And in our daily life as visa officers, for instance, we get a lot of information from uh, students, prospective students that we interview. And some of that information isn't all that important. And some of it is very important and learning how to pull those important pieces out um, is very, uh, very good for our work. The other thing that I've learned mostly from graduate school um, is the idea of critical thinking, approaching a problem from multiple angles, trying to figure out a solution, and then taking your solution and poking holes in it, figuring out where you're wrong or where it can be better, because your first solution is almost always never the best solution. You can always make it better or quicker or more efficient uh, or cheaper, uh, depending on what you're talking about. So the ability to think critically, which Unati, you mentioned at the beginning, uh, US universities are very good at teaching students how to think critically. And I think that is one of the most important skills that I took away from my years in college. Awesome, thank you. That's uh, definitely, 
really a highlight of the US uh, education. I guess uh, to uh, Clint, I would ask a different question. Um, what made you decide to get into your current profession of being a visa officer? Yeah, so it kind of is related to one of the early questions about your you know, alumni network and friends. But, you know, as I got to a few years into the Air Force and after I had, um, finished my first master's degree, I wasn't quite sure what I, what I wanted to do. And I actually went to a friend's wedding in Colombia. And uh, he was in Colombia because he was a uh, foreign service officer. And so I learned more about it and applied. Um, and it's a very, very long process. And so I ended up having time to finish out my Air Force time, bounce over to Facebook. And then when the time came, um, I was ready and uh, ready to go. So just once again, yeah, having a strong set of friends and alumni uh, around you is very helpful. Awesome. So I think with that, we'll wrap up the presentation session uh, section so that we can take uh, in the la last uh, 10 minutes or so that's left uh, some questions by the audience uh, so they can interact with you. Uh, definitely, again, like, you know, it is it is really tough being a visa officer, but we just want this session to be proof that it is like, you know, the visa officers who are interacting with you are empathetic. They have been there, done that. So they do understand what it means and what kind of experience you're going in for. So their main job is to judge you to be a valid student. So they've already been there and done that. So obviously they are not out there trying to get you or something. They just want you to be successful and choose the best applicants uh, for the visa, uh, you know, process. So with that, if any of you would like to, uh, you know, like um, say anything else about your journey before we take questions. No? Okay, great. So we can just jump in, but uh, quickly, if you want to take a screenshot, students, of this uh, slide, these are all of our Education USA services. We are virtual at the moment. You can follow us on all social media, and at the bottom uh, point, you can see my email ID and WhatsApp number, which I operate, so you can get in touch with me uh, for any questions on higher studies. Um, I do see some questions in the chat box regarding that. Uh, so you can directly get in touch with me for more uh, information. Uh, this is the information for visa questions. Uh, this is a co consular contact information. If you have anything, any questions specifically to visas, uh, you can uh, go ahead and email. Uh, you will get a response, uh, you know, in a few days uh, so that uh, it is full proof and uh, we can ask more relevant questions today. So without further ado, I would like to invite you to ask any questions uh, you have to the visa officers present today about their uh, your schooling experience. Um, okay, we can uh, go backwards. Uh, you can type it out in the chat box. Let's uh, take one question which Sneha has asked. Do you have any suggestions as a visa officer for international students, uh, how they could get ready for a visa uh, interview and how to answer anything uh, answer how to answer or anything not to be hidden like is there anything that they uh, should disclose which students may not disclose usually i'll take this first one and maybe Tim can take the next one um, i think in general the best way to prepare for your visa interview is the same way you prepare to apply to that school right so there's no hidden combination of words that's going to get um, and automatic approval. If you're a qualified student for that university, um, if you use those same skills and demonstrate those same skills, you should be generally in good shape. So I wouldn't advise trying to hide anything. Um, generally speaking, if you're honest and open, you've got a clear plan that makes sense from an academic standpoint, um, and you've got the finances to get you there, then uh, you should be in good shape. Awesome. Thank you for that uh, advice. Uh, okay, so we do have some questions. Uh, again, uh, these are a little more general questions on visa interviews, so we can still ask them. Uh, how much money is required to be shown on the visa interview? I guess this is for a student visa. So uh, if either of you want to answer this. So there's no um, hard and fast rule on that. What, what visa officers look for and what United States universities look for is the ability to pay for the program. So in the same way that when Clint and I were applying to schools, if it was clear that we would not be able to pay for the program, we probably would not be accepted into the program. And I can think of at least one university that rejected me for graduate school for that precise reason. I simply could not afford the program. So I 
said, all right, I'll, I'll try something else more within, more within my range, but there's no, again, like, like Clint said, there's no magic combination of anything that will help, but we, but visa officers need to know that you can pay for uh, the program itself and the school will help you figure that out as will education USA. Thank you for that plug. <laughs> definitely come to USIEF and Education USA. We will definitely help you understand your budget. Um, oops, what's going on? Yeah, so uh, a few more questions. And I guess these are again uh, related to studying and the visa interview as students plan to apply to different uh, universities. Um, Supreme has asked, um, I am already pursuing a master's degree in information technology. It will be completed next year. I also got a job after doing it for one year. I'm planning to pursue a master's in game development from the United States. Will it cause an issue in the visa application and interview? Yeah, so um, this can get a little tricky. I think um, it's really key for you to, and for you know anyone who's thinking about taking two really similar degrees in the same field at the same level, it's gotta make sense because master's degrees aren't cheap, right? And so if it doesn't make sense why you would spend tens of thousands of dollars to study the exact same thing, or maybe instead of information technology, it's information systems, if that doesn't make sense, it's gonna be difficult for you to demonstrate why you would be a good student. So have that in the back of your mind and think, I mean, do you actually, is it really important for you to get that um, game degree? Is there maybe a certificate that makes more sense? And if you're dead set on it, just make sure that you can articulate that um, at the time of the visa interview. Thank you. That's uh, really good to know uh, that, you know, like, so just similarly, like, I think I would uh, also refer back to the advice in the beginning of this, uh, these answers is that just how you would explain to uh, your admissions officer why you would want a place in that university. Similarly, you have to explain to the visa officers uh, why you want to study that degree. If your uh, conviction is clear, then you should not worry at all. And like, you know, uh, should have that answer already. You should already know the answer to that, that question. Uh, okay, we have, yeah. I, I agree, and one, one, one quick thing to add on that is that, um, as Clint said, like the, the idea of moving from one thing to another, if they're the same, needs to make sense. And in the same way, moving from one degree path to a very different place also needs to make sense. So if everything that you have done, say a bachelor's degree in um, information technology, master's degree in uh, computer information systems management, and all of a sudden you're applying for a fine arts degree in uh, visual arts, like painting. Well, why? If it turns out that that entire time you didn't really want to work on computers, maybe that was what your parents wanted you to do, but your passion, what really excites you and what you really want to do is painting, then that should come out too. If you're passionate about a topic, people can hear that in your voice and they'll be excited for you too. So as long as uh, you come at it with, with a sense of commitment and passion, I think uh, you'll do great. Thanks, Tim. And in, in fact, you almost answered a question which is related to that, although it's slightly um, different because it says, can we change our stream from electrical to something related to IT? I guess this is also, um, I, I could add to that question by Neeti. Uh, sometimes students change, you know, what they're studying in India and then want to go in for a completely different type of degree. She wants to go in for still related to STEM, but some students will go for a completely different, uh, you know, career path. So how would they explain that, I guess, in a visa interview? Do you want to follow up on what you were saying before? Sure. So um, as long as the, the explanation for why that's happening or why you are pursuing that uh, degree at that time makes sense, there shouldn't be a problem. So it, it, it's when, as Clint said, things can get dicey when when something doesn't make sense. Um, you have a master's degree in, or you have a, uh, an MBA a degree. Maybe you want to do another MBA in the United States. Why? Well, if it turns out that those two programs have very different focus areas and that they are complementary to each other, that's a compelling story. So um, shifts in uh, focus area, um, you can you can certainly change a major after you begin a program in most cases, uh, but shifts in what you've done for work or past education and then what you'll be doing into the future, 
can certainly be explained. Um, and as long as you're not, you know, lying or deliberately misleading uh, why you are making those decisions, it usually turns out well. Awesome. Thank you, Tim. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, let's go on to the next question. Um, okay. Okay, so this is a very interesting question. And I think it's a much debated question. Um, is there any problem in uh, getting a visa for a community college if a student wants to transfer into a four year university after the two year degree. So it's very common, uh, you know, in the United States for students to start off an associate's degree in a community college and then transfer into a four year bachelor's degree. Is there, is, if a student, an international student chooses that path, a parallel path, is there a problem in getting a visa? So, oh. Yeah, I'll go first then Tim, maybe you can add any context if I miss anything. Uh, so I'll say uh, I personally approved a student who was going to community college today. So I don't think there's any hard and fast rule against community colleges. I think one thing that is probably uh, misunderstood is that when you get outside the main envelope, so we see a lot of Indian students who come to the US for their master's degree. I would say that's probably about 90% of the folks that I see at the window, right? And so whenever you're not doing that, you may raise an eyebrow. And so kind of going back to what Tim said, you really need to make sure that you uh, have thought through your plan um, and it makes sense. And you use that same kind of rationale that you used to get into the university. There's nothing wrong with the community college. We see a lot less folks applying for them. And so it may um, catch the visa officer by surprise, but as long as you have a good plan that makes sense, your finances are in order um, and you can you know, demonstrate that you're a good student, just like any other student um, should be in good shape. I agree. Um, my father attended a community college. So I've, I've always felt pretty highly about them. And in the United States, we have a lot of very, very good community colleges. And a lot of them that feed into larger state school systems. So, uh, any, any very large one like a, like California or Texas, some of our largest states have very well developed community college systems for that very fact. But as, as Clint said, the, the reason for studying there has to make sense in the broader context of your uh, educational history, maybe your work history and your interests. So as long as that all makes sense and lines up, community colleges are absolutely just as valid as any other degree program in the United States from bachelor's to master's to PhD and beyond. Awesome, that's very good to know about the confidence in community colleges uh, at the, co uh, the US consulate Kolkata. I think that's very encouraging for our students and also us as advisors to guide them then through this process, you know? So again, I, I would also like to point out another resource students who have applied and got into community colleges is your admissions office in the community college. We actively work with representatives uh, from there who are based in India. They're India like, you know, based uh, representatives of those community colleges who do webinars with us, who do sessions with us and are happy to guide students because like Clint said, it's a very good point that you've chosen the, un, like, you know, the path not taken. So obviously you are going to be questioned a little more. You have to explain yourself a little more. So you can ask them about students who've had a similar experience and how uh, they could, uh, you know, how you could navigate uh, such situations more successfully. So they are also a very great resource. Get in touch with us and we can put you in touch with, uh, you know, the representatives from different community colleges. Uh, so that's, uh, that's okay. That's a very good, uh, you know, like answer. Uh, I guess some other more specific questions on visa is that um, what is the basis on which a visa might get cancelled? Now, um, that's a little vague of a question, but I guess uh, the student may mean like after they become, get a student visa, what is, could it get cancelled and what, what could cause that to like get cancelled? So if we're talking specifically about visa cancellations, generally speaking, across whatever visa class it is, the only thing that you really have to worry about is not using your visa properly. If you are issued a visa for a specific reason and you use it for those reasons, um, and there's no other you know, criminal history or anything crazy like that, you should be in good shape. So I, I wouldn't really worry about that. Um, one thing I like to focus on is 
you know, let's worry about the, the bridge at hand, right? So um, right now, I think for a lot of folks in this call, it's finding the right program that makes sense for them. And then after you get through that, then let's worry about passing the, uh, the interview. And then maybe after that, we can worry about a visa getting canceled, but uh, it's not definitely a, a huge concern, I think. I think that's a very good uh, piece of advice. Uh, okay, so let's move on to the next few questions. I guess there's a more specific question about uh, application. So uh, Ujil has asked about admission to PhD programs. Uh, what are the opportunities for me at Renewable Energy? I have completed my master's degree in machine design and bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. How can I apply from India and what are the scholarships available for PhD? So I could on, uh, take that question very quickly. Um, Ujjal, you could get in touch with Education USA. Basically, the basis of getting scholarships, like we've also talked in this program, is merit basis. For graduate school, uh, the only way you can get a scholarship mainly is through merit for international students. So you can either get an assistantship or a fellowship. An assistantship is where you're working under a faculty member as a research assistant, teaching assistant, or a graduate assistant. And uh, you can get either your full tuition off uh, and a, like you know a stipend for living cost as well as a portion of your health insurance off as well. And it depends on the subject you're trying to study. Since you are a STEM student, there is a, uh, and trying to do PhD, the application process may be very tough, but if you do get an admission, more than likely you will get a full funding uh, for that kind of a program. The way you're going to apply from India is, again, do get in touch with us. We have basic orientations every day where we guide students through the research, uh, funding, completing your application, and then after admission, uh, getting a visa and preparing for departure. So uh, get in touch with me and I can uh, guide you to one of those webinars. For a PhD, are, are there any exams? Uh, most universities do require you for the programs you have mentioned, a GRE, as well as the English language proficiency test, so either TOEFL or IELTS. Nowadays, some universities are accepting Duolingo and PTE as well. So check the university website to find out the exact requirements for that degree. And make sure to go to the department page. You know, sometimes students, the same university may have different requirements for two different departments. So go to the correct department page. Um, Okay, so let's go to the next question. Okay, again, this is a little bit more of, um, this is more of a visa question. Uh, if if they, a student gets an F1 visa from one school and wants to transfer to a different school, do they need to uh, like, you know, interview again or can they just transfer their I-20 and attend the new school uh, if the school agrees to take the admission? I think that is probably best answered on a case by case basis um, because they would want to uh, reach out to the consular unit in your district, mm -hmm. uh, wherever you might be and uh, go from there. It's, it's best to get best to get an answer to your specific situation okay. rather than uh, like a general answer. So this is a consular contact information for the US consulate Kolkata. So just send an email or you can call in to the call center um, and ask your question. Awesome. So is there any other questions, students, you still uh, like, you know, we are almost over time. We are really over time now. If there's no other question, uh, I would like to thank uh, Tim and Clint for really agreeing to this web very unconventional webinar and, uh, you know, like braving, talking about your stories to students. Um, I personally haven't done this kind of a webinar before, so I know this is one of uh, its kind in this district and around India. So thank you so much uh, for, uh, like, you know, being here and talking. If you have any closing comments, uh, you could make them right now. And thank you to all the students for attending and uh, listening to our officers. Uh, thank you, Unati, uh, for the invitation. And uh, another plug for Education USA and USIEF. Great programs, great people. And they are critically important in helping us reach uh, people who want to study in the United States. So thank you for having us on here. Uh, I enjoyed answering these questions. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the interview window. I'll just echo the same. Um, I always love doing these. And so thank you so much, Nati, for setting this up. And um, yeah, have a great Tuesday. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.